speaker. Or if you've debugged your audio, just type question and I'll turn your audio on. So our speaker today is Trevor Bedford. So he got his PhD under Dan Hartle at Harvard. Now he is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Associate doing research in the lab of Mercedes Pascual at the University of Michigan, where he's studying the evolutionary and epidemiological dynamics of the influenza virus. Today he will be speaking about his work in a talk entitled Adaptation and Migration in the Human Influenza Virus. Take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I'm not exactly sure how this the, the internet talk will go. Um, because my slides are pretty detailed. So one, one thing that I thought that might help is um, I put up a PDF of this on my website. Um, I'm typing out the address now. Here. If you go there, um, you can get you know full resolution pictures if you want to follow along with that, or you can just follow along in the little screen, um, whichever should be good. So talking about the influenza virus, which I think is, is a really fun system to work with, because it evolves so quickly, and there are new strains that are emerging all the time, and those, you know, in a couple of years will take over the population. And so we kind of have this situation of, that uh, uh, William Gibson described, for the, the futures here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So he was talking about technology, but we, we have this with, with flu in that there are a number of strains around, and that the future is here at the moment, but it's just not been amplified and become the, the dominant strain. So I'm trying to figure out kind of what makes a strain take over the population. And there's a couple different things I'll look at. The first is uh, different selective pressures, what makes a strain good in that way, and also in terms of where in the world should a strain be to make it more likely to take over. Um, OK, so some background on flu. Uh, this is the, the schematic of really how quickly it evolves. These are amino acid sequences that I've um, gathered from the database. Each different color is a different sequence. And you can see that at any given moment, there's a lot of different sequences around. Um, but on the whole, population turns over very rapidly. So that from 2002 to 2009, we've um, 120 sites have, have differed roughly in flu. And um, if you're familiar, the population genetic parameter theta works out really appropriately, so that if you take a if you made this same picture here with a uh, Drosophila gene, if, and you took this five million years rather than um, seven-ish years, you'd get something that looks very, very similar. So flu is evolving so quickly that you we get this turnover in time that we can observe. And also because of this, the evolutionary dynamics become linked with the ecological dynamics, um, which is uh, makes it more complicated and more interesting. So, okay, so rapid evolution. Uh, in, in what I'm looking at, I'm going to kind of restrict myself here uh, in terms of the, the, um, the proteins in the virus. So here we have the, the flu cell, or the flu um, particle. Uh, this membrane has been stolen from the host cell, it kind of buds off. Um, on the surface, uh, we have neuraminidase, which are responsible for leaving the host cell and hemagglutinin. And so these act as little grappling hooks that when this virus particle floats by a, um, a cell, these will shoot in, pull them together, and then spill the single-stranded RNA into the cell, and then the virus can go about making more of itself. Uh, hemagglutinin is the primary protein of the flu that we see as humans. And so it's the protein that kind of we're interested in in terms of vaccines and so on. And it's also the protein that the flu is interested in in terms of mutating and changing and trying to evolve more quickly than the humans can respond to it. So in the talk, this is, where, this is kind of where all the data is, is I'm going to be focusing exclusively on, on hemagglutinin. OK, so hemagglutinin. And now this is a, a genealogical tree made from uh, hemagglutinin in a number of different, this is basically all the different um, hemagglutinins that I could find. And so we, we see that, and I've colored them according to their host species. You can see that there are chains of uh, transmission where the virus is kind of endemic within a, a host. So that um, kind of, I'll walk you through this. Uh, here in this lineage, um, prior to 1918, uh, this was in birds, the semaglutinin. And then it moved into humans, causing the Spanish flu and killing 50 million odd people. 
Um, and the screen dot here is someone that was dug up from the permafrost in Alaska and had their flu sequenced. This chain of infection of H1N1 continues in the human population until 1957, when there's another bird flu creating H2N2 that persists as a um, as seasonal epidemic lineages of um, until 1968, at which H3N2 emerges. H3N2 persists until 2000 until today, and um, there's also a reintroduction of H1N1 in around 1977. And so, uh, today we now have um, old version H1N1 that is ancestral to the or as a descendant of the 1918 Spanish flu. We have the new swine flu H1N1, which actually comes from all the way back here, prior to the Spanish flu split. Um, and we have H3N2 in the human population. So I'm going to be focusing, so before the swine flu stuff, for the last 30-odd um, years, H3N2 has been the predominant bad thing that, um, that we've been dealing with. And it's been um, more people get sick, and it makes them sicker than H1N1. And so I'll focus exclusively on this H3N2 lineage um, and its evolution. There's, uh, so what I want to respond to in both the um, selection and migration. So the current kind of favorite hypothesis seems to be that there, the antigenic evolution of hemagglutinin, at least in, in H3N2, has been very episodic. So these, uh, this picture that you see is from uh, Derek Smith's group. And what they did is they infect ferrets with different versions of flu and see how much cross-reactivity you have between them um, to get an idea of kind of the cross-immunity structure. And what they end up with is these um, kind of clusters where flu will be around here in 1968, and then it takes a big jump in phenotypic antigenic space, and then it takes a and it stays around for three years and takes another jump, and so on. So they have this idea then um, that, or previous work in my lab, that you can build this into an epidemiological model where by having these, this kind of neutral network of, um, of phenotypes in which there are only rare mutations to a very new, novel, beneficial antigenic phenotype, you can um, get the appropriate level of selection in the influenza virus. And so, so this is kind of a nice uh, combination of modeling and data. But I wanted to, um, to poke this a bit more from the, like, looking very cleanly at more recent times when we have more data to see how, how well does this evidence for episodic evolution stand up against an idea or a model of continuous antigenic change. The, uh, so the other piece that I like to look at is these spatial dynamics. This has this very clear uh, model in literature that we have this source sink. Um, this comes from Russell et al. in 2008, where there's the flu that's in Southeast Asia, in China, and then twice yearly. So in the Northern Hemisphere winter, um, people from China move out and make everyone sick. And you have this local epidemic, regional epidemics that sweep through. And then at the end of the winter, they die out leaving this endemic reservoir in China, Southeast Asia, and then the other um, in Northern Hemisphere summer, Southern Hemisphere winter, you get another regional epidemic. But this would imply that the ancestor of all flu, all H3N2 flu, is always in Southeast Asia. And so I want to, to look at this more to see really where in the world does, um, does the ancestor flu come from. Uh, to do this, I'm going to be using a lot of the, the coalescence. And so, Oh, hey. Let me get this. Should I? Should I be waiting? Uh, are you waiting for me? I, I heard the little ding. Um, like oh, there's I'm a sorry. question or something. Do you know what that was? Yeah, that, that was unrelated. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. I, I actually did have a question, <laughs> mm. which is, um, I mean, in that previous, in uh, two slides ago or so, there was, uh, with the slide with the clusters. Yeah. Um, how many substitutions are we actually talking about there? Like, uh, how many between these different? So between, they, they can't narrow it down that tightly 
because um, there's just a lot of substitutions that go on. So between each cluster, there's a small handful, three or five. Um, and yeah, they can't. Okay, they can't exactly. Five. That's not that many, though. I mean, that's no, no, not at all. Um, but you know, over this whole span of time, they'll ha they'll have been many. Um, so I said, I said before, like twenty and five years and ten years. So, yeah, um, sixty or something over the span of time. But the um, between each cluster transition, there's only a small handful. Um, so going to be dealing with the the coalescent. And sorry, I uh, just want to give a little introduction to it. Uh, so this is a this is an individual, this red dot. Oh, and one other thing here, um, I really don't think this will come through that well on the the screen sharing. So I also, if you are interested, you can go there and um, get this in real time rather than in. Um, kind of chalky time. So uh, that's an individual, and this, it can replicate. But I have this constraint that whenever new individuals emerge, we have to keep the population size capped. So this is kind of the standard population genetic requirement. Um, so I'm going to restrict this to this plane. So we have these three individuals. And then you can see that a replication event causes a branching. And then here's the death. So we'll add some more individuals. And then now the Moran process is just we have at a constant rate individuals replicate. And then whenever a single individual replicates, it causes a random individual to die. So when we add this, we, we see that we get this dynamic process. And the demographics of the population start playing out. And then very quickly, I'll stop that there, we get the uh, canonical coalescent tree so that uh, at the beginning, the tips are very short. So I actually have, oops. Sorry. Uh, so at the beginning, the tips are very short, but the deep branches, uh, the internal branches are very deep, like this. And so this kind of gives the one of the basic population genetic results that most genetic variation is shared between individuals in the population. And the other thing is that um, kind of oftentimes phylogenies are thought of just kind of the way that parsimony ended up working is that they were thought of as these splits are due to mutations. But really, when we're looking at these genealogies, uh, these splits are replication events, are, are the actual historical replication events. And mutations are embedded into this process. So we can see that we had um, kind of two independent red to green mutations here. And that happened from a single individual but then their child, an individual and their child. And so that the um, mutation doesn't create branching. So uh, the mathematics of this process gives this very kind of simple principled way to say, how likely is it to see this certain tree or this other tree? Uh, given uh, a population size going backwards through time. And so then if we want to estimate this population size going backwards through time, we can then use these uh, uh, coalescent, these Bayesian inference methods to say that we have, um, we have a mutational process and we have a demographic process. And what I'm interested in really is these coalescent parameters theta c. And how I get them is that if I I ha can write down the likelihood that if I have a certain tree tau and I have mutational parameters theta m, I can write down the probability of observing some sequences uh, d. But then taking one step back, we can nest this inside and say that given coalescent parameters theta c, these are like affected population size and so on, we can have the probability of observing a certain tree tau in the first place. And then um, we use standard Bayesian techniques to flip that around and use MCMC to then sample from the posterior distribution of trees and parameters. And so we get a posterior distribution over mutational parameters like mutation rate, transition and transversion bias. We also get a distribution of trees. We get a distribution of effective population sizes. Uh, so to do this um, uh, analysis, I use BEAST um, by uh, Alexi Drummond and Andrew Rambo. Um, this for this first part on selection, I'll be using migrate to deal with um, these migrational patterns, which are written by Peter Beerley. 
And then I had to do a, a lot of uh, post-processing and all the trees that were spat out by this. And so I wrote this program, which you can find, um, called PACT to just um, cut up and analyze trees. OK, so uh, first section, uh, demography and selection. Uh, here is a more, so I, you had that um, tree that we sh I showed you before. And this is just a more detailed look at the genealogical tree of hemagglutinin for H3 and 2 influenza A. And the, the thing that kind of has struck people a lot with this is that from 1968 until the present, there's, the tree is very spindly, that there's not, there's not very many strains circulating in any given moment. There's not much um, genetic diversity. So you can see that by like taking a line up through an individual date, like 1980 here. And then if you take all the samples that exist in 1980 and trace them backwards, they'll find a common ancestor in just a couple of years. The, um, okay, and so what, what we have here, and what I, I really like using trees in this context, is that you can kind of see the population genetic process play out, so that imagine that if we have a, a mutation that appears in 1970, and it appears on this lineage here, on the trunk of the tree, that we will have the population genetic process of mutation polymorphism fixation. So that mutation appears here, and then for this span of time, um, from 1970 to 1977 maybe, uh, that will be a polymorphism within the population. But then when these side branches die out in 1977, that mutation becomes fixed. And so then that mutation will be forever fixed in the population until that site gets hit again by another mutant. Um, alternatively, we could have a mutation here on the side branch in 1970, and then we'd have mutation and we'd have polymorphism until 1977, but then that particular mutant would be lost, and the, uh, that particular allele would be lost from the population. And so you'd have uh, mutation polymorphism loss. Um, yes. So this, this tree, it was what was striking to people is being able to compare this tree from flu to a very similar disease. We have measles, which um, is somewhat re related. This is the hemagglutinin gene in measles. Um, fewer people get sick with measles every year, yet if you look at, <clears throat> at its genealogical tree, you can see that if we take flu that, or sorry, if you take measles that was around in 2000, you have to go back about 50 years for them to just find a common ancestor. And the, uh, the basic explanation for this was just that selection, so that uh, in flu, the, the trunk, this branch is better than this branch, and so it kills off this trunk branch here is better than the side branch down here, so it kills it off, and you're eliminating them. And so this kind of makes a lot of sense phenomenologically. Um, whereas measles, you don't have that. Where measles, there's lifelong immunity, and one version, one strain kind of um, can be swapped with another strain. So there should be kind of neutral evolution going on with measles. Um, but instead of maybe saying, so that, that was kind of the way that it was usually formulated. Um, I'd like to make this a little more exact, maybe, by describing this in terms of effective population size, so that you could actually get a very similar, you get a very long and spindly tree like flu with a small effective population size, and this deep bushy tree like measles with a larger effective population size. So to give an example of what that looks like, um, these are simulations that I ran uh, with the Wright-Fisher model. And so in this top left is I take 10,000 generations um, with a population size of 500, and I take samples, and then I reconstruct their genealogy. And we get something that looks like flu, or it's spindly. But then as I add in more and more individuals to the population, the tree becomes more and more bushy. So you see that now with 20,000 individuals, um, we have these 10,000 generations at the tip, and then you have to go back full 30,000 years, 30,000 generations, excuse me, to find a common ancestor. So you can see that we can kind of move between this um, spindly tree and this bushy tree just by adjusting the effective population size. So what I would say is that the, it's not that this tree shape comes from selection, it's that from this tree shape, we know that flu has a very low effective population size, and we know that selection like this is kind of a standard population genetic thing, selection reduces the effective population size. So we end up with more of a causal linkage between 
um, spindly tree, low effective population size, therefore we think selection. Um, to kind of show an example of this back of the envelope calculation, uh, the actual number that we'd estimate from this flu tree is that the effective population size is 7.2 years. So this is the inverse of the rate of coalescence. So it takes on average um, two lineages from the population 7.2 years to find a common ancestor. Uh, if we uh, take the duration of infection as five days, this will be the generation time of the uh, virus population. We get an effective population size of around 500 individuals. Uh, and then while with measles, uh, we take this tree, we calculate an infected population size of 125 years. Um, given a duration of infection of 11 days, we get around 4,000 individuals. And then with measles, this 4,000 individual effective population size is not off by so much from the census population size of almost a million individuals. So we're off by a factor of around 200, which could be epidemic peaks and troughs. It could be a number of things. Whereas with flu, going from 500 effective individuals to a census size of uh, 70 million individuals, we're off by a factor of 13,000. So this kind of tells us that something must be going on, and it kind of tells us how how really, and we think that the only thing that could result in something of this magnitude is selection. And it gives us an idea of kind of how how powerful selection is in reducing the effective population size of, of flu. Okay, so I'd like to look a little more um, astutely, more in detail at this, this um, selection, at this adaptive evolution. And so then, oh, sorry. And so rather than looking at this kind of general pattern over 30 years, I want to look at the last 10 years and see um, is there is selection constant, is it episodic, and so on. I'm going to do this by running a lot of simulations first, look at kind of build intuition from the simulations, and then look at the, uh, compare the simulations to real data. So the simplest simulation is to take this um, selective neutrality. Uh, we have 5,000 individuals, Wright-Fisher model, just as I mentioned before, 10,000 generations, and uh, there's no selection here. And what you see is that there's this very deep tree that if you take an indivi two individuals at generation 10,000, they have to go back uh, almost 10,000 generations to find a common ancestor. And so what, what I'm plotting here um, in these, these three lines is first is the TMRCA. So that's if we take a slice, say a slice at generation 4,000, I'll have all of these lineages. And I trace them back, and it's how many generations back do I have to go? And we see that for this whole length of time, we have to go back around 10,000 generations, which is exactly what we'd expect from the population genetics. We predict that uh, TMRCA should be 2N. So when N is 5,000, we should expect TMRCA to be 10,000. Diversity is when we take a slice, and rather than tracing all the way backwards, we compare each pair of tips and see how much genetic distance separates them. And in this case, the, uh, we get basically flat at 10,000 generations, which is exactly the, the population genetic expectation as well. And then NE here, I plot it as the, it's basically the instantaneous effective population size. So we take very small windows and move across this and see how fast is the rate of coalescence, take that inverse, and that gives the effective population size. And so again, NE kind of stays constant at around 5,000, just like we'd expect. Okay, so now uh, first complication, we'll add in a uh, constant positive selection. So same 5,000 5, individuals, but now we have a fairly high rate at which new individual mutations appear that grant a low selective advantage. Um, the exact numbers don't really matter. So, and what, what I plotted here is we're going from purple to red is we get this continuous sort of upgrade to the population. Um, as it becomes fitter and fitter. Uh, and what you can see here is that, or I hope you can see it, is that there are times like this where you can, where the reason that this lineage takes over is that it's already becoming orangish, whereas its competing lineage did not grab as many mutations, so it's still kind of green. And so the orange lineage can kill off the green lineage. And what you're seeing there now is, is I think, a pretty good illustration of um, clonal interference. I hope you've all heard that term. So um, these mutations here, because there's no recombination, 
they, they're they competing with the mutations here. And so even though these over these 2,000 generations, these individuals got a lot fitter and grabbed a bunch of beneficial mutants, those beneficial mutants will be pushed out of the population by other beneficial mutants that just happen to be more beneficial. So uh, this competition among lineages results in um, the pushing down kind of all of these parameters. So we see that rather than 10,000, Team RCA stays at around two or three thousand. Diversity is also around two or three thousand, pretty flat. And so we've we've reduced the diversity in the population compared to the, the neutral case. Um, however, if we take these windows, the um, affected population size isn't affected, isn't um, impacted very much. And this is because uh, diversity in Team RCA are mainly looking at the deep branchings, whereas the uh, affected population size here is looking more at the tips. Which aren't as a um, aren't as impacted as much by uh, selection. Okay, so constant positive selection, and now looking at episodic positive selection. So same 5,000 individuals, 10,000 generations, but now we have a, a low rate of mutation, and each mutation having a high selective advantage. So that going from purple to yellow here, roughly the same selective advantage is accrued. Um, but it's done rather than in 50 small steps, it's done in uh, three big steps. And what we see with this is again, so you can see that um, that blue emerges and it slowly diversifies over this period of time. So it's now neutrally competing with one another, and so it diversifies. But then when there's a green mutant here at generation 7,000, green quickly kills off through blue, and then yellow quickly kills off green. So then what we see if we look at Team RC and diversity, is that when a new mutation emerges, that we crash Team RC and we crash diversity. And so we get this neutral buildup and then this crash. So I would, um, and then if we look at effective population size, um, instantaneous effective population size, we see that during the period of the sweep, so while blue is sweeping, it's very significantly reduced. Um, however, right after the sweep has completed, uh, we're back up to to neutral levels of um, effective population size. So I would I would propose that it's actually going to be pretty tricky. This this plot here that I have is the um, I should have mentioned this before is equivalent to the uh, Bayesian skyline plot that Beast will spit out. And so I would propose that if you're trying to look at kind of these temporal patterns of selection, that the the skyline plot is maybe not so good um, because you have to kind of catch the sweep in progress. Whereas looking at these more summary statistics of diversity in Team RCA, you should get this pattern of um, slow increase, rapid drop, slow increase, rapid drop as uh, indicative of episodic selection. Okay, so comparing this now to, oops, sorry, to real data. Uh, this is uh, sequences from the database uh, from the last eight years, uh, roughly 2000-2008. Uh, each gray dot is a sample from a sick person, uh, and the bright colored dots are the strains that were chosen to be vaccine strains after the fact. So that, um, you know, in 2003-ish, they're looking back and they're looking kind of what's around if they chose this, this strain to, um, to update the vaccine for. Uh, and same with, so we have Fujin 02, California 04, Wisconsin 05, and Brisbane 07. Uh, okay, and if we look at now these uh, these statistics over time, we see that uh, for this first part of the tree, first half of the tree from 2000 to 2004 roughly, we have these two competing lineages. So we have this branch here, and we have this lower branch here. And because these are persisting, uh, have, are coexisting, we're slowly building up um, the TMRC and we're building up diversity over this time. But then, roughly corresponding to the emergence of Fujino 2, um, the side branch that doesn't have Fujino 2, so Fujino 2 um, is the top branch, the side branch now starts to die out. And we see that diversity starts to decline, and then minimizing once the side branch is completely killed off uh, about a year later. Whereas, so, so this kind of fits now, this first part fits the, the pattern that I had before from episodic selection, where we get this build up and then this decline. Whereas then looking at from 2004 to 2008, um, over this California 04, Wisconsin 05, Brisbane 07, 
the diversity stays pretty flat. It, it just stays constantly low. We don't get these jagged. It's not slowly increasing, and it's not doing some bouncing up and down. So given this data, the kind of a parsimonious explanation would be that around 2003, um, late 2002, there was a innovation in the flu population along this trunk branch here that caused it to be more successful and then antigenically um, more novel, and then it outcompetes the side branch here, killing it off. Whereas over this time, we are still accruing um, small amounts, small incremental steps of antigenic novelty. Um, and so we still have selection, but it looks more, more constant. Uh, so that, that, I mean, that's the, the, the picture I paint just from looking at the data, which pretty well goes along with more recent findings from Derek Smith's group. So here on the left, I have the, uh, the cluster map that I showed you before. Um, from 1968 to 2002, and since that time, they've now, since 2002, they've had a lot more data. And so on the, the right comes from this Russell et al. 2008 paper, and so time is going 2002 to 2007, and each dot is a strain of flu, and then it's antigenic distance from this cluster from Sydney 97. And what they found basically is from 2002 onwards, there really hasn't been any of these large discontinuous cluster transitions. It's kind of drifted. Um, there's been more continuous antigenic drift as the, uh, the virus population um, pushes away from uh, Fujino 2. Uh, if, if I drew this distance of 10 here, antigenic distance of 10, that would be this red line here. So you can picture, I don't know why I haven't seen this published, it's strange, of um, if you updated this map to include recent data, Fujino 2 would be this big long cluster that kind of is this far, and there's no major discontinuities within it. So it, it seems like, I mean, it's not much of a resolution, but that uh, flu can either be have episodic selection, it can have occasional large jumps in, um, in antigenic phenotype, but there's also periods of time where for a, a fairly large period of time, a number of years, it can uh, have these continuous antigenic improvements. And so we need some sort of um, epidemiological model that can describe how, um, how the um, patterns of diversity that result, even when there's not these kind of only major discontinu uh, discontinuous jumps. Um, so I'd like to, to make a plug for that here, in that the I think these doing real epidemiological models with flu is, is important. So in everything that I had kind of presented as these, these simple results were uh, uh, for the simulations were this Wright Fisher standard population genetic model where the, const the population size is constant and that a, that a mutant basically just grows faster than another one. That there's no, that's the only kind of assessment of something's fitness. Whereas with the uh, in reality, the flu population is fluctuating over time, it's very seasonal, and the selection is not really being imposed by um, just being better, it's being imposed by being different. So in these epidemiological models, we could have weak selection, which looks something like these, we get these deep branchings. We could have strong selection with competitive exclusion, which is what basically what it looks like. Um, and so this is the this antigenic type over time, phenotype over time. or it's possible, it's very possible, and it's strange that it, we don't, it doesn't actually happen, is that there could be a split where um, the virus population partitions itself into two different uh, niches. And so um, we get this blue niche and this red niche. And now they're both in their cross immunity such that they can both persist in the human population. And so then you should expect lots of selection within a lineage, but kind of these speciation events so that this tree from strong selection with these splittings will actually look very similar, kind of an overall diversity level if you take it in this time here, because we have deep branching, so it will look similar to a weak selection tree. And so I think we need to like get some um, kind of tighter connection between these uh, population genetic coalescent models and the epidemiological models to really um, kind of understand what's going on with selection and flu. Okay, so that was the first part. 
Uh, second part of the talk is on spatial dynamics. Um, and here it's the, the fit of the, um, the models for the data is a bit tighter. Uh, what, what this is kind of prompted by is if we look at the, this is just a time series of infection by H3 and 2 in the USA. It's um, highly seasonal, so that most winters, not every winter, um, H3 and 2 sweeps through, gets everyone sick, and then dies out. And what's unclear here is um, where did this come from? So in uh, the, where, where in the world did the start of the epidemic come from? And then during the epidemic, does it go anywhere? Does it just die off in the USA, or does it migrate elsewhere? Uh, so there are basically three different models that could describe these, these highly seasonal patterns. So one could be that there's local persistence, that even though um, it looks like there's this huge trough in the summertime, that there's enough people sick, that there's a chain of infection, and then come um, fall and winter when the conditions are right, that chain of infection will take off. And so what we'd expect then is that we'd have a northern population of flu and a southern population of flu that are very distinct and that they each form their own chains of continuous transmission. Uh, this model we kind of know is not, not true from, um, from uh, just looking at the phylogenetic trees of, um, of flu from New Zealand and from, uh, uh, from the USA. They don't, they, uh, they form lineages off of a, a single trunk rather than kind of um, feeding into one another. However, the, the two models that it's, it's been a little more unclear of which, which is going on is we could have dynamic migration where the, um, the southern lineage um, here in, the, in its high season is the thing that seeds the, the northern epidemic and then the northern epidemic seeds the southern epidemic and so on versus a source sink model where the northern and the southern epidemics go extinct at the end of their seasons and then they're continually reseeded by an endemic population in the tropics. So this source sink model was elaborated on and investigated in this, this Russell paper. And what they did is they took, um, they did a really good effort to get samples from um, a number of places around the world and then looked at, built a phylogenetic tree. So here's their, um, their samples on a tree and then calculated the distance to the trunk of um, for each region and then found in general um, China and Southeast Asia are closer to the trunk of this tree um, than North America, Oceania, Europe, South America. And so from this concluded that um, always flu is moving out of China, Southeast Asia into these other regions of the world. And then concluded that the, the ordering is due to um, kind of the pattern of migration, that the reason North America follows you know, follows up after China is because it's second in this chain. So uh, I'd like to investigate this more using these, these coalescent methods. Uh, so in, in this case, rather than a single population that individuals are replacing each other, we now have, in addition to replication events, which go replication forward in time, coalescence backwards in time, we have migration. So here we have red individuals and we have, oops, sorry, red individuals and blue individuals. Um, going backwards in time, we see that these blue individuals can coalesce with one another, and then we also see that red individuals coalesce with one another, but occasionally there's migration events where this um, red population, red island, we have an individual moving over to blue island, and once it's in the blue island, it can coalesce with the other individuals on that island, and then migrate back to red island. And so what we can then do is we can take data that has, uh, that's, oops, that's tagged, so I have sequences that are tagged with dates and with locations, and then fit this into one of these structured coalescent models, so that in the, the coalescent parameters, in addition to including the effective population size of each region, includes the rates of migration from one region to another. So this is um, all the data that was collect, that was in the, the database. Um, from 1998 to 2009. You see that it's heavily biased towards lots of USA and New Zealand samples. Um, so in, um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but in all of this work, there was a lot of effort made to, um, 
to poke at and to see kind of if these um, sampling patterns are having any effect. And then basically, no, that, that we, can, we can say that the sampling patterns aren't, aren't giving us our results. So um, I take this, run this coalescent model, and we get, this is just one of the trees it spits out, because there's you know, many, many samples of trees. Um, but this already gives a, a lot of, of information. So uh, this is the, the genealogical tree now with um, the samples colored according to place of origin and the, um, the branches accord colored according to their inferred location by, um, by migrate. And um, kind of to, to walk through this a bit, we can see, so, so what, what we see is, for instance, we have this clade, this um, lineage of, um, of virus in Australia that shows up around in the middle of 2004. And then we see that um, a very similar genetic um, virus shows up in Japan later that year. And so kind of what the program will end up inferring is that we had this uh, migration event from Australia to Japan to create this, this connection. And so over all of this, we can start inferring migration rates. Uh, to walk through it a bit, um, what's interesting, it's like immediately interesting, is that in 1999, we have this USA epidemic, which is in yellow. And you see that the USA epidemic seeds the future virus population. So it makes this side branch, this side lineage here, which is major, and it also create, it also seeds the, the entire um, trunk and the, um, the entire population of the future up here. Um, whereas the Chinese samples during that time don't go anywhere. They kind of see this um, side branch here that then goes extinct. So just from this, we can infer that mutations that were occurring in the USA in 1999 would um, flow through and would be caught by the, um, the virus population and stick around. So then also going on from 1999, we see that during this span of time here, from 2002 to 2004 roughly, we have a side branch that's mostly in the USA, then in um, Oceania, then in Europe, then in South America. There's very, very few um, Southeast Asian Chinese samples here, whereas we have this other lineage where it's in China and Southeast Asia predominantly. So just from this piece of the um, genealogy, uh, we can say that the uh, virus can persist within the tropics, so it doesn't need to be in the north and the south. It can live in the tropics um, happily. And it also doesn't need the tropics for persistence. So it can be sustained by continually bouncing north and south. Um, and so we can get these um, temperate metapopulations sustaining the virus as well. So to look at this a bit more clearly, um, we, we can extract the uh, migration rates that, that are inferred between these different regions. And that what we get is for a single chain of infection, so um, individual to individual to individual, uh, we see that China and Southeast Asia are, um, yeah, it's China, Southeast Asia, and the USA as the centers of the, the migration network. And South America is kind of off, where it only gets its flu from the USA. Um, and Europe and Japan and Oceania are, are also not, not major contributors. Uh, so, however, if we actually were calculating total flow, gene flow, from region to region, we'd see that just because of the number of humans in um, China, that it would kind of swamp out all these other rates. However, if we're really interested in this, this trunk of the tree, so we're, we're interested in tracing back, oops, sorry, uh, the trunk of the genealogy, that's a single infection. So this is an actual person to person to person um, chain of infection that happened in the world of a single person moving about the world. And so what, um, what is important for this trunk um, branch is actually the, the, single, the single lineage, the single chain of infection um, migration rates. And so it can look a little more clearly and pull out the, the, these trunk branches from uh, these uh, 5,000 trees that I sampled. And so now these are kind of all the trunks stacked up. And this gives an idea of how much certainty that we have of where the trunk of the uh, influenza genealogy is at any given moment. 
So as I was saying before, we see that in pretty much every um, genealogical tree we sample, the uh, USA forms the trunk in 1999. And that we see that from 2000, 2002, um, we know that the trunk's either in China or Southeast Asia, but we're really not sure which one it is. Uh, kind of what's, what's really helpful here, and what's interesting that, that the method uh, works so well, is that there aren't any Southeast Asian samples until 2002. So the first Southeast Asian sample is here, yet the, the model can pick out that it could well be Southeast Asia for this period, span of time. Um, and then moving forward, we get these times when I would say that we're, we're not so sure. Like here in 2003, where it's saying USA, USA or China. And so that, that could mean either, um, either uncertain, it could be USA or it could be China, or maybe it could be somewhere completely different in the world, um, which is a, a little tricky. Uh, but during these periods when, when the, uh, the model says with, you know, 100% basically that it's in this location, I would, I would say that we're pretty confident that the flu actually was in that location in that, um, in that period of time. So from this, we get this, um, this nice result that the, uh, that evolution matters outside of the tropics. So that uh, if, for instance, Tamiflu is used, or Tamiflu is H1N1, if, um, if vaccinations and so on occur, that the impacts on the USA trunk lineage um, will matter here. And that mutations accumulated in the USA during this 1999 epidemic would matter. So we end up with this more global metapopulation model, and which emphasizes that the uh, flu could come from anywhere in the world and we'd need widespread surveillance. Um, and this also then opens up the possibility that, as I was showing before, we have, it's, um, we see that South America pretty much gets all its flu from the USA, from North America. And so rather than using the same vaccine strain, what would might be good is that if you vaccinate South America, um, favor, preferentially with strains that were in North America the previous season, rather than just taking the, the global the global average. Um, and so getting kind of more of these details of the migration network kind of might help with this. OK, so um, the, the last piece of the talk, and this is a little more um, hand wavy, speculative, is um, doing some forecasting. So we actually know a lot about kind of these statistical regularities of flu evolution so that um, we saw that 70% of the time it was in China, Southeast Asia, um, of the, the trunk was. So that then just, you know, if we were betting, uh, we, would, we might predict that out of the strains that are around today, 70% of the time, uh, the next season's flu would come from China, Southeast Asia. Um, so then we can kind of investigate these regularities a bit more, a bit further with a kind of full statistical model that would include these spatial dynamics, but also could include the substitution rate. So we want to know, does the, um, does the trunk evolve more quickly than the side branches? Um, it, I mean, the trunk evolves more quickly than the side branches. And so then this would predict that of all the strains that are around in the world today, the strain that has more mutations is more likely to be the trunk in the future. And the, um, we know that the coalescent rate differs for the trunk as well. And so that could also be an indicator. And then also, if we actually look at the antigenic data, we have these, these maps that Derek Smith has, and we kind of look at how the um, strain, how the branches are moving around this antigenic space over time, and then we can see how the trunk moves versus how the side branches move. And doing all of this to then predict, uh, you know, six months in advance, uh, which branch will be the trunk in, in six months' time, which then could be you know, used in vaccines and maybe um, save some people's lives, maybe. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, to thank my collaborators, Sarah Kobe and Peter Beerley, um, the Pasquale Lab and the um, EEB Theory Group, my advisor, Mercedes Pasquale, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for funding. Be happy to answer questions. Thank you.